Parashat Pikudei. <coughs> so this, uh, this parasha is, uh, first of all, dedic- dedicated to, they didn't text me back, but it's dedicated to uh, Ella Bat Chana, and to the Rafua Shlema also of, uh, of El Chanan Tzvi Menachem Ben... Uh, I cannot see without my glasses. And also for the Hatzlacha of all our friends uh, that are out there, and especially our commander in the West, Rabbi B, which I recommend all of you to check out his, uh, his uh, audio podcast that we have on our website. Talking about a website, of course, guys, of course, everybody has to know, guys and girls, Boys and girls, <coughs> that uh, we have merchandise, and you can uh, get some merchandise of the yeshiva, be a part, a representative of the JSAR unit, the JSAR community, Jewish Search and Rescue, because no Jew left behind. You can check us at yeshivetzion.com, also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook YouTube, YouTube and everywhere else that you wish to and, and desire. Anyway, and don't forget, of course, uh, yeah, you know what to do. Anyway, so at the, at the uh, final psukim of the parasha, which in a way are also the final psukim of the whole entire chumash of, uh, of uh, Shemot, we read the following. anan et ohel moed, ukvod Hashem milait mishkan. And the cloud, cloud of course of glory of the of divine providence hovered and covered the whole entire uh, tabernacle and the glory of God filled up the the inside of the tabernacle itself velo yachol moshe lavo el oel mohed ki shachan alav ha'anan ukvod hashem mila et hamishkan and moshe rabenu could not have entered the, the uh, premises, the parameter over there. Why? Because the glory of God and the cloud was hovering it and it was filling the whole entire thing. And when the cloud has been lifted and hovered over from the, from the Mishkan, from the parameter where the Mishkan is, the Jews have started to start the journey. If it stays there, they stayed also. Why? Because the cloud of, of God, the glory of God is on the Mishkan, on the tabernacle at, uh, at night. Uh, a day and at night is going to be a pillar of fire, and everybody saw it all the time. All the Jews, everybody saw it all the time wherever they traveled. And of course, there's something that it's quite wondrous in the in this whole event altogether, this whole ordeal altogether. Because listen, they put a tremendous amount of work into building the Mishkan. I mean, it was an effort. And it was expensive, and it was it was major. And imagine this: you're building. Let's say you're building a, a giant house where you uh, you spend millions of dollars, and and I don't know why you do that, but yet effort and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, you get the CEO to enter, and now you cannot enter. What is this? After this whole entire thing that they build. And, and everything was to, to dwell, so, so Kadosh Baruch the glory of God, would dwell there, and the result is not even that, that they, they can't come near it. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, <coughs> he wanted to get in, but he couldn't get in. So it's, it's, it's like, it's strange. What was the purpose of all this? I mean, they should make like a big party, a housewarming. Everybody comes in, sees, sees God, how you doing, you know? You bring, bring a bottle of wine, bring a bottle of bourbon, you know? Like, like we do. What kind of a thing is that? So the other, the other question that we have, why is the Torah 
repeats later on and deals with the job or the duty of the cloud to, to be a guide for the Jews, right? When they travel through the desert, <clears throat> something that was already beforehand. I mean, they did it beforehand. But when he came out of Egypt, we had the same thing. So why does the Torah repeating it to us now again? And, uh, and I mean, even now, the, the whole meaning... I mean, even now, the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole purpose is even greater because uh, that that shows the the dwelling of of, of the of the of Hashem within among Am Israel. So what's what's the whole what's this whole concept all about? Oh, maybe let me just excuse me. Just want to see if they answered me something because I'm looking for somebody's name as well. So the name is yes. So this is also the refuah shlema of. Uh, Harav Yaakov Ben Bela, and he should have uh, he should have uh, tremendous refuah mm -hmm. speedy recovery, mm -hmm. and be quick to uh, continue his holy work out mm -hmm. there. Him mm -hmm. and his family and everything that is with him. Now, <clears throat> so I guess the biggest chiddush, the biggest concept that we have. That the the Mishkan was there. It wasn't just a that they built the temple like Lehavdil Chaz Shalom to say, but Lehavdil like an idol worshiping temple. You know, they build something, they put a couple of statues in, they call some Italian decorator. You know, they put the whole entire spiel together. Okay, everybody comes in. Oh wow, that looks nice. You know, here the whole purpose was that they build it so Hashem will have a place here. I mean, that, that's by itself also a little bit bizarre. So if he's already in, and we cannot go in there, something is something is not sitting right. Therefore, we, we don't really need to. We don't really understand it. So now, if you look at the Ramban, Ramban Nachmanides, and his uh, introduction to or what he wrote at the beginning of uh, of Sefer Shmot, ah, that's who's missing. Yonatan is missing. Yeah, text him, Sammy. <coughs> Hello, Yeshua. Take over there some good stuff. So the Ramban says on the on the introductions for Sefer Shmot, it says, and I'm quoting, "Ve'nei agalut ainu nishlam ad yom shuvam el mekom ve'el ma el mekomam ve'el maalat avotam yashovu." The Ramban writes the following: the exile or whatever the concept, an actual exile, it's not going to come to an end until the Jews will come to their place. And to the level of the forefathers, they need to return to that level. And when they came out of Egypt, even though they came out of slavery and they were supposed to be free men, they were still were not what we call actually free. The Ramban is mechadesh here and says the following. He says, until then, they are still considered to be in exile. They are still considered to be refugees. They are considered to be refugees. I didn't want to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. There is a halakha that uh, says that... Uh, Non-Jews cannot just come in and settle down in the land of Israel as they feel like it. There has to be certain rules that they have to follow. The minimum that they have to do is to accept Sheva Mitzvot Ben Noach to become Neochite and then to become a resident alien. They know even a chala, and but to go like this, that should not be. They should not because that's that was given to us. What I want to tell you might get aggravated some people, but you know me, you know, I'm a maverick, I don't really care, I do what I want, I say what I want. Because I really try to say the truth of what I feel is the right thing to do. I think that the state of Israel had made a crucial mistake, but not opening its gates to the refugees and to the poor people of Ukraine, regardless what the Ukraines used to be mm. in World War II and before that in, in, during the Cossacks and so on and so forth. It means that we should not forget what happened to the Jews. 
but we should act as a beam of light to the nations, to the Goyim, to show people what is the right time to do and not to sit down and to stop making calculations, some pity calculations about is it going to be played to the hands of Russia, is the Russia going to allow us to do so, and so on and so forth. We need to be able to say and do the right thing and say, these are people, Ba'asher Hem. As much as we read, and I told you this a million times, as much as we read in Rosh Hashanah, out of the whole entire Helegei Torah, the Holy Torah, the whole thing we read is about Ishmael, because the concept is Ba'asher Hu. Right now, those people are refugees. And they don't have a home, and they're being persecuted, and they're being butchered in brutality. And we as Jews should have known better to open the gates and to first of all open our hearts to let those people in. And we haven't done it. And we, it's wrong. And we haven't said anything, even us as Jews here in America. It's not just about Israel. As Jews in America, we also have to come up and cry out and say, let those people in. They should come to America and settle down. We should help people when they need it. That's what we are Jews for. We didn't get the piece of real estate in Israel because God is a, is a real estate agent. We got the state, the, the place in the land of Israel to become a beacon of light to the nations. And this is our obligation, and therefore it's your obligation to open your mouth and to write to your senators, to your whoever it is. Yes, I know they don't read it, but it, whether they read it or not, it's not an excuse for you not to do it. Those people need to have a place. They need to be to treated like, like people because we do remember what happened to us when we were sent and no nation opened the doors. They were sent back to, to, the, to the chambers. And we should learn from that. We know how it feels. And I'm very upset about this. Yes, I know the Ukraines. We know the stories of the Ukraines. But we also know as the Jews, and I know what happened, and now that we are in a position to let people in, we must not have to, we must open the doors. If not, it means that our heart is closed. And I therefore urge everybody to do that. Going back to the, to the, to the and I'm going to tell you something, and I'm sure those people that I just said for the Refua Shlema, they also hold the same way because they are very dear people to me at least. So, you know, we need not only, somebody told me today, I think, uh, you know, it's, oh, whatever, I, I don't want to get into this. Let's just go back to this parasha. There is a, by the way, there's a difference between what we have to do and what we need to do and then what we must do. This is together must. We must do that. America, for crying out loud, it's so big. We can have, you know, a million Ukraines inside. We can do it. Akadosh Baruch Hu, God will help America to sponsor those people. I mean, anyway, we sponsor 40 million illegals from every area in the world. <laughs> and they were not refugees. Let those people in. Why is the door closed? Well, it's like too hard for the United States to send, you know, a whole bunch of like uh, C-10, you know, galaxies to put them in and ship them in, send them with jumbo jets with 77, with all 78, 7, and just bring the people in for crying out loud. That has to stop and we need to open our mouths. So now, so they are considered to be exiled. Why? Because they were in a foreign land, Nevochim, they were confused in the desert, they didn't know where they're going. When they came to, to Mount Sinai, another hospital, the, the one in the desert, and they built the tabernacle, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu returned, and he, and he bestowed upon Am Israel his holy providence. Then, they reach the level of the forefathers. We need to do the same thing. And the key for that, of course, is to be united. That's without, the, without, without, a, without a doubt. And that is when it says the, the secret of the concept of Eloka Ale Eloheim. 
the God is hovering over the tents, each and every one of us, and the households. Vehem hem hamerkava, and they are the chariot of, of Hashem. So therefore, you could become that also. You could become a chariot for for holy providence in this world. That you introduced us into this world by by doing chesed, because we did say olam chesed imane. We have to build a world of chesed. And we need to internalize and understand that. The fact that you are free doesn't mean that you, you have a home yet. It says, Ve'az nikshivu ge'ulim. Golim is exile. Ge'ulim. When you put the Aleph of Hashem inside, you have a ge'ula. When you make yourself into the Merkava, you become the ge'ula, you, become, you put Hashem into your life. You are considered to be redeemed. Ve'lachem, and therefore he says, Nishlam ha'sefer hazeh. This book was concluded with that. Be'hashlimo, in Yana Mishkan, uve'yot kvod Hashem male oto tamid. And because of that, that's the last part of the parasha. Behold, the whole exile of Egypt, and going to exile, and coming of Mitzrayim, and going to the desert, was only to do that. But true redemption only comes when you introduce God into your life. And I'm going to tell you something. How do you introduce God into your life? You don't say, hey, you're doing God, you know, just come in. It starts with something very simple with intent that we have. For example, first thing you do in the morning. What do you do in the morning, first of all? But you look at your telephone? No, you get up. Then after that, you do Netilat Yadayim. Netilat Yadayim is the same thing as the Kohen did in Beit HaMikdash. You're starting your day with sanctifying yourself to Avodat Hashem. And everything that you do from that point has to be for, for, for the sake of Hashem. You have to have an intent. You have to have a reason why you do certain things. And that only have to be directed to Hashem. So one thing, for, for, for example, if you want to prevent yourself from doing the wrong thing, is what? Ask yourself a question. And the thing that I'm about to do is God's going to tell me, out of boy, that's my, that's my, that's my boy. We're going to say, what is this? Is what you're about to do is going to be glory to God? Is going to be glory to, uh, to your nation? Yes, do it. No, don't. And that's the whole concept of Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem is, everybody knows you're a Jew, but you are desecrating Shem Hashem. Ki Shem Hashem nikra alechem. Because the name of God is upon you. Chilul Mishum unholy. And we can't do that. And you have to be very careful. However, when the, when the Kadosh Baruch Hu came in, it, was, it, was, it filled him with what we call with the light of Hashem. But that light of, uh, that was there, it was, it's, it's quite confusing. Light is something that is very limited. Right? Light is not beyond time. It's all in relation and so on and so forth. Right? So therefore, how could that light that HaKadosh Baruch Hu refers to and that we will come to and the Torah talks about it, could, could uh, hold within itself a concept of what we call Ensof, eternal. It's, it's really impossible. Because it says, it says, Hinea shamayim, ushmea shamayim, lo yechal kelucha, afki abayit azeh. The whole entire universe cannot hold God, not even this house. So how is it possible that God put himself inside the house? Okay? So it's quite possible so that at that moment of, of Hash, what we call Hashra'at Shechina, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually entered the thing, Moshe, Moshe could not have entered in because it was just too great to, to bear. It was just overwhelming. Now, the cloud itself, when we're talking about the clouds, has those opposites within itself. It's also limited and it's also unlimited. Ensof, it's unlimited. The light of Hashem, he puts it into the into what we call into boundaries. So therefore, if you want to also find Hashem, if you want to find God in your life, you gotta look at the boundaries in which Halakha gives us. If you look at Halakha, if you look at mitzvot as a burden, as a restrictive mode, you're never going to see God. You're just basically a donkey putting filling on. You have to understand that God exists, as they say, within the details. In the small particles, that's where you're going to find God. So, that uh, 
that uh, that concept is 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 tremendous for us to understand. Now, how do we also connect to it? Now, how do we connect to these things all the time? No, it's fine. How do we connect to this? Well, you know, every every generation or whatever had its own has its own disease. For example, in the uh, I don't know 1800s and so on and so forth, it was uh, opium. Everybody was smoking opium. In the 20th century, the the greatest disease was smoking. Everybody was smoking. The smoking is bad for you. I don't care what you smoke. Smoking is bad for you. And for me, it's so pathetic to think that people think that smoking pot is actually good for you. I mean, you have, excuse me, you have to be a moron to think that. Because the same thing as if I'll tell you that smoking cigarettes is good for you because it's good, to di for good for digestion, because that's what they believe. People at the time believed that smoking is good for your digestion. Oh, smoking is good for me. You know what you do to your lungs? It's like putting your mouth into an into a exhaust of a truck. It's bad for you. It's just an excuse that you make. Oh, it's good for me. It's bad for you. But in our time, in the 21st century, the greatest disease is sitting down, not moving, sitting on your phone. You don't have to, I mean, you, you, that's why it's good to have books, you know, like this. You want, you, want a, you want a book like this, you have to get up and get it. But when you have the phone, all you gotta do is this. Uh, hold on one second. Oh, let me see. Oh, Ravavad Yeshua. Oh, read this. Safari. Everything. I, can't. I don't have to get up. The whole entire world is in my fingertips. Let me put my phone back to the holster. Right? So in our generation, sitting down, not moving, is the, the death sentence, is the cancer of our generation. And, and what, what does that mean? If you don't exercise, for example, your body regularly, and I'm not talking here like a Greek, right? Nefesh bria beguf bari, that's what the Tzionim used to do, right? But if you don't exercise your body, if you don't work, everything was meant for our body to do. You know, we need to do peulot, we need to do actions for the body to move. If you don't exercise your body regularly, the, the functioning of your body might deteriorate. Actually, not might, it is going to deteriorate and most likely going to put your, your, your uh, just wait with this a second. Just put yourself into a state of, uh, of great, uh, great danger. Cholesterol will go up, blood pressure will go up, this will go up, and so on and so forth. So you need to exercise, you need to be in movement all the time. <clears throat> and of course the question is, if that is only for the body, or this is also true for our soul, for our spirit, and for our awareness. Do I need to have my spirit always moving as well? And I'm going to tell you where the mistake is because there is a parallel universe between the spirit, spiritual world and the physical world. And whatever works here works there as well. Now, how much do we always want to achieve the, the destination, the, the final stuff, the final uh, I mean, spot? For example, I'm sure you all remember how, uh, how eager you were and your parents were also to celebrate your bar mitzvah. Wow, it's bar mitzvah. Or when you, to find a job, or to finish college, and so on and so forth, to get married. Or to have a child. And so on, and everything else. The truth of the matter is, all those points that I just mentioned, bar mitzvah, getting married, and so on and so forth, are just an introduction, an intro, to the real thing that haven't started yet. Parents spend thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars on a bar mitzvah, but would not spend a penny to send the kids to yeshiva. Parents will spend thousands of dollars on bar mitzvah and try to get a deal on filling. What happened to the education? The bar mitzvah is just marks you the starting point of what you need to do. And what you need to do is to educate your kid. 
But what happens? We send our kids to schools, we send them to secretary yeshiva, we don't want to do the job, hey, I'm paying you, you educate my kid. It doesn't work like this. Who, who, who celebrates the bar mitzvah? The principal at the school or you? I'm buffoons. Yeah, and get married. Okay, got married, mazal tov. I mean, like idiots, people are spending $200,000 on weddings. Never even bothering to give their children the proper tools to deal with marriage from this point on. This is just an introduction. And there's something for us to learn from that as well. Right? We always concentrate on the, on the, on the, on the final point and not on the journey. Even Aerosmith knew life's a journey, not a destination. Right? That's what it is. Life is a movement, a constant movement. Our end point is our death. And along the line, there are certain markers that we do to celebrate those things. But what's important is the journey. So, okay, so a person had a child. So now what? I'm gonna hand it to somebody else to educate him. Okay, so you finish college. You rush to finish college. For what? You rush to go to work. For what? To buy a house to become a bigger slave. You work like a dog all your life. And now you're going to buy a house and now you're going to be a slave the rest of your life. 100%. What is this? We got it wrong. We got it completely wrong. So, how do, how do we go about this? How do we stay in focus? Well, the remez is in the Anan, in the cloud and the pillar of fire. That was the beacon that directed us where to go. So we need to concentrate on the light of Hashem to connect ourselves, lead the back, to attach ourselves to that light of Hashem in order, Rabotai, not to get lost. Somebody told me, we were talking about this, and he said to me, you know, what's the, perp what's the meaning of life? It's the, I don't know, this is, he says to me, to have a meaning. Yes, it's like a revolving door, but the meaning of life is to have a meaning. When you live, no, when you live life without a meaning, it's not life. Only when you introduce any meaning to your life, then it's considered to be life. But the true meaning is to be midabek be'or Hashem. Is to connect yourself to the light of Hashem. So how does a person, how does a person, let's go back to, to, the, to this concept, how does a person attach, attaches himself to this light? The answer is, Bechol Masa'ehem, in all the journeys, in other words, in any aspect of your life, you need to refer to it towards Hashem. <coughs> and how, what are the tools in which I am, using what I need to use in order to attach myself, to dedicate myself to that light of Hashem. So it's with your will, with your longing, and with perseverance, continuing going. Movement. If you are, if you are not evolving, you're dead. You stay behind. You have to keep on moving. How much do you really want to? Now, longing means that I, I want to, but I really, that's a higher level of wanting. I, I want to, but I'm not willing to do longing, I'm, I'm desiring. How much are you willing to connect yourself to Hashem? Are you willing to give anything from your life or, or to live life according to Hashem? Or it has to be all for you. If it is all about you, you are selfish. If you're selfish, you are starting with, with rust, as I said to you before. Ratzon atzmi, rashet evot ra. Ki re yetzer ha'adam, ra min ha'onav. Ra min ha'onav, you know, egoism is out of control. Selfishness is out of control. Constrain yourself and just give to society. Contribute. Care. So these are the tools that we need to start doing so. So, so the, what we call the, the divine providence, the Asharat Shekhinah, is not the end 
of a of a journey. The Mishkan is not building the Mishkan was not the, the end game. That was just a starting point. It was the bar mitzvah? It was just a starting point on the beginning of a new journey. And in the desert, it was the, the journey to Eretz Israel. And the truth mm -hmm. matter is that the beginning, the 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 Aaron, we used to hover every time in a different Shevet. All the time. The reason or what it comes to teach us is to teach us as well that even, even the Avodai, the Mishkan itself, after the, the, the Kohanim could enter, then the whole nation can come in and do Avodat Hashem, bring Korbanot and so on and so forth. Even that, when it already, Hashem already gave you the, gave you the space, this, did his own Tzimtzum in, into this world. Also, the secret for that is now that you actually enter, there's other, t other tools that you need to use. And the tools are perfection, longing, in Hebrew it's called Hishtalmud, Ga'agua Vechisufim. Ga'agua Vechisufim are different levels of, of longing to someone. And in Nichsaf, I'm, I'm, I'm with all my, with all my koach, with all my entity, I'm, I'm longing to, to dwell in the house of Hashem. To be in His midst. To direct my life towards Him. To make his will my will. But that needs perfection. And that needs to be a constant moving. Never rethink that you reach the, the Nachala. You reach the, the promised land. And you made it. Because look at what your forefathers did. Look at their level. And you're not there yet. Le'olam lo ta'amin ba'atzmecha ad yom motcha. Until your deathbed, don't believe in yourself that you are free of work. Right? So, when we, when we yearn to reach a certain level, right, that's very good. People tell you, you should reach a, for example, here, I'll give you an example from, for Sam, a martial artist among us. Right? Sam always heard, I'm sure, right? I want to be a black belt. And you, when you go to people that they want to, for example, learn martial arts, is, why are you coming to learn? I want to be a black belt. Okay, so it's another guy, pay your dues and let's go. When a student comes to you and he asks you why you want to learn martial arts or whatever it is that you learn in martial arts, you know, karate, taekwondo, he says, because I want that way of life, that student you should teach him for free. We should not strive for certain points we should strive for a way of life. To be a Jew doesn't mean to just do this and do that and, and reach certain milestones in your life and check another check and then another check and then another check. Is a way of life. That's how you live. Being ever the Shem is a way of life. The concept of a way of life hardly exists in the West. But it is our way. Torah is a way of life. It's not a theology. It's a way of life. In which all aspects of your life have a Torah perspective to them. From the day that before you conceived until the day you after, after you die. It's all, all aspects are covered. So, and the depth of that, of that uh, perfection of this continuous perfection actually represents the opposite of Ratzon Atzmi. It represents what we call Ratzon Hatov, the goodwill. The goodwill is, has another word for it, and that's called Bechira, free choice. Our ability to choice, which is another layer in the understanding of what does it mean, Betzelem Elokim Bara, you know, that we created in the image of God. And the history of Am Israel starts with those two big journeys to Earth Israel, right? And that's first of all the journey of Avraham Avinu from his land, from his household, and the journey of Moshe from Egypt to the land of Israel, what we call Mibet Havadim. 
<coughs> to Avraham Avinu, Hakadosh Baruch Hu said, "Hitalech lefanai veyet tamim." Walk with me or in front of me, but be whole. Tamim being whole, complete with me, not right? Because it says Omar, uh, and that's what, what Hashem said to him. Now, on the pasuk that we have, also well, one of our forefathers, Veishev Yaakov be'eretz migurei Aviv be'eretz Kanan, right? And he settled down, Veishev Yaakov. Now, if you want to know why Yaakov had to go to exile, it's because of that. He settled down. Rashi says, based on the pasuk in Midrash Rabbah, Bikesh Yaakov leishev b'shalva. Yaakov wanted to chill out. He said, say that, all right, I'm in retirement now. Kafatz alav rogzo shel Yosef. He got him busy with Yosef, so he won't feel so settled down and all good. It says, Tzadikim mevakshim leishev b'shalva. Tzadikim wants to be left alone. Omer HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kadosh Baruch Hu said to them, Lo dayan le tzadikim, ma shemetukan lahem laolam haba, it's not enough what they have in the world to come. אלא שמבקשים להישב בעולם הזה, בשלווה בעולם הזה. No, it's not going to be like this, Habibi. You got to work, you got to move. And as we said, the end of Parashat Pikudei is also the end of Sefer, of Chumash Shemot. And very gently, the, 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 it hints towards the concept that the Mishkan is already built and is already put together. And, uh, and the end psukim really told us about the affinity or the link between the Mishkan and the clouds of glory that filled the, filled the whole uh, tabernacle over there. And the Mishkan as a, as a, as a, as a building was, was really designed as a, as a, as a, as a whole an apparatus, right? And it's something that it's very effective. You can take it out, you can put it apart, and so on and so forth. And this is how Bnei Israel went from one station to another station in the desert. And every time that the time came to, was about to go, right, the cloud removed itself from the, from Oil Moed, and it went outside of the Machane. The cloud lifted up like one of those uh, drones lifted up and went, was waiting outside of the Machane. Why? It was pointing out in the direction in which they need to go. And this is what the, the last psukim of Sefer Shemot actually described. I'm going I'm to finish in a second. It says, Ki anan Hashem ala mishkan yomam v'ayesh te yeh layla bo le'ene kol b'nei Yisrael, again, b'chol masayim, in all their journeys. But the cloud was not on the, on the, uh, on the mishkan while they traveled. It was only when they settled down. So, what does it mean? You know, the cloud was, was ahead of them. So why is it Bechol Masayim? Right? So Rashi already noticed this, this, uh, the problem with this, with this thing, with this issue. And Rashi says the following, Makom Chanayatan Af Hukaru Masa. The place of their resting when they stand is also called the journey. Lefishim mi Makom Chanayach Chazru Venasu. From here, they kept on going, they kept on, and therefore, even that is called Masayim. The Rav Kook says something on that. It says in uh, in Orot Hakodesh, it says that, that this is this the movement of the Aaron and the, and the whole interaction between the Aaron and the clown. It's this is the chidush of Briyat Olam in general. And it says the following: Ma anachnu choshvim al davar matara elokid b'amtzat ha'avaya. What what do we think about about the uh, creating of reality, or what was the real divine purpose in creating reality? That the absolute perfection is, is, is a given. It has to be. And nothing could be forced into it. Everything is, is acting and acting by itself. In other words, God did not create an imperfect world. God created a perfect world. So what did he leave for us to do? It's called Hosafat Shlemut. Additional perfection. Sheze iev shar liyod ba'elokut shar ashlemut amuchletet ena ena ein sofit ena manicha makom lo sofa. When God creates something, there's no room for us to add something because God does everything perfect. God did not create the world semi blemish; He created it perfect. It says vele matara zo she osafat ashlemut. Adding on to perfection, that is something that should not be missing in our reality. So therefore, this is our, the world reality 
needs to form itself around that veliot lefize mitchila matchilat mitachtit liot shvela. In other words, it has to start from the very, very bottom. It's what we call the grassroots movement, and we have to strive up. Klomar mi maamat shel achisaron amuchlat. You have to have absolutely nothing. You have to realize that you have absolutely nothing. And that's exactly what happened to Bnei Israel. And you create yourself a certain path that you're going to go up and up until you're going to come to the superior level of, of elevation. And reality was created in such a thing. In other words, to create, to give into the person the desire to progress and to become better all the time. That is within you. It, the world is already perfect, but for you it seems that it's not by Akadosh Baruch Hu creating this. That's why a person wants to become better and to become more and so on and so forth and become more advanced and smarter and richer and so on and so forth. Why? Kizoti Pula and Sufit. Because that is an endless path. Shezeu Eden Meyuchad, Shezeu Bezea Priya Mashlemet et Kvot Bora. And this is how we interact with Hashem. We need to strive to become better. Sheneemar, because it says, Lo alecha melacha ligmo. It's not up to you to finish, but you must continue building. And the whole concept of Beit Amigdash is like this. Do shelo nivna bo Beit Amigdash. It says a generation in which Beit Amigdash was not being built. Nivna, being built. It doesn't say on a generation she Beit Amigdash lo Banui, Nivna, to show you that everything in this world is a process, and the prof- process has to be a profes- process of perfection, to try to perfect yourself, to strive to a divine purpose, which is getting closer to Hashem. And Rabotai, this is what we need to do. As much as a person, that's why people want to become greedy, or become this, or, or power, and so on and so forth. But it, it, to take this ability of wanting to become better should be directed not towards the chomriyut, materialism, but rather to, to get closer to Hashem. If a person wants to become, he's power hungry or he's greedy, he, has to, he needs to know that he has this, or he, for example, desires kavod all the time, he needs to know that he has this ability within him, he just needs to direct it to the right place, to the light, to Hashem. And that is the message of this parasha. So, but I have Shabbat Shalom, and please uh, don't forget to uh, send the emails as the way we said.